I haven't uploaded a video in a while and I'd like to explain why, and also give you a hint of what I should be beginning on in the next couple of weeks. Despite acquiring a lot of interesting gear to show off and developing a lot of projects, I hit some snags that made it impossible to continue. The first of those is I tried to get into capturing video, and I immediately discovered how difficult that is. I knew it was hard, but the cost and complexity of it has turned out to be way more than I realized. Capturing VGA from old DOS machines in particular is very tough and requires a very expensive capture device. I finally got one a few days ago and it isn't working. I don't know how long this will take to work out, so I decided to shoot some video with a camcorder pointed at a monitor for the meantime just to show you what I'm planning on doing on my channel. The second issue is the DOS machine I was going to use, the Pentium laptop I wrote about on my website, turned out to have two critical issues. One is that the game port doesn't work, which sucks, and the other is that it scales its output video if the internal LCD is turned on, which is a critical failure. It's a shame since that machine was really very good and was working fantastically other than those specific problems. So to solve this, I decided to pick up a desktop machine. So this is that machine. It's a Dell Optiplex GXI. It looks a lot like Dell's following Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 machines. They used this styling for a while. It's a Pentium MMX 200 megahertz. It's got internal slots, so I can put ISA and PCI cards in it. No AGP, but honestly, I don't terribly care about that at the moment. But I am interested in trying some old PCI 3D accelerators and maybe even some video capture cards and sound cards and other things from that era. So this is actually a perfect machine for that sort of thing. Also, obviously, it has five and a quarter inch bays, which means that I can put a full five and a quarter inch floppy drive in it, which will be good for loading up some very old software. I might not be able to run it on this machine, but I'll at least be able to rip it. And since I'm interested in ripping every piece of software that I end up getting, uh, I'll at least be able to do that on here, even if I still have to get like an old IBM PS2 or something like that to actually run that software. To that end, I've installed NetBSD on this machine. My choice of operating system is not a debate I'm interested in having. I chose it for my own reasons and because I thought it would run well on a Pentium machine, which so far it seems to. The reason I'm putting a Unix-like on here at all is so that I can boot into it in order to rip floppies, both big and small, and CDs in order to get bit-perfect copies of them. And I prefer to use the DD tool for that rather than any Windows imaging tool. There's also a Unix tool called DD Rescue, which should help me recover disks that have been damaged, or at least get as much data out of them as I can. So I'm going to go ahead and start this machine up so you can see what it looks like booting and how the monitor looks and everything. That was a tremendous amount of relay noise. The primary hard drive in this machine is about 120 gigs, which the BIOS doesn't really recognize, but it works okay in the OS itself. There's also 64 megs of RAM in it. I do have more SD RAM, but I haven't put it in yet. You'll also notice this machine has built-in USB, which is fantastic, and it also has a network interface card, a 3C905 from 3Com, which is great because everything had drivers for it back in the day. Now I'm running Windows ME on this, which some people would consider to be kind of a ludicrous decision. I have lots of explanations for that, which you can find on the article I wrote on my website about solving all the problems with making a vintage DOS machine. Suffice to say, Windows ME, once you add the ability to get back into DOS from it, actually does a great job and is a fantastic choice for a machine of this age. I will go ahead and put a link to that article in the comments on this video because I think that it's really important to have a lot of this information ahead of time. If you decide to get into doing a project like this, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. And if you aren't already very thoroughly experienced with doing this, and I am, I did this several years ago, but this was prior to YouTube existing, you really will be lost trying to figure out where to start because there's a lot of caveats and a lot of gotchas. So take a look in the description of the video and there'll be a link to my website article. I want to take a moment to apologize for the flickery video in this, by the way. This is a CRT monitor, so of course flickering is expected, but I couldn't see it on the camcorder's LCD, so I thought it was going to be okay. It's moot, because in the future I'll be doing everything through a capture card. You're not going to be staring at a CRT like this. There won't be room light to deal with and everything. That's just for this video, because I don't have my VGA capture rig up and going yet. So please forgive me and bear with me. So here we are in WinMe, or Windows Millennium Edition, or Windows ME, depending on what you want to call it. The reason I put Windows on here at all, other than Windows 3.1, is because there's a lot of software from the late 90s that is interesting and mostly forgotten. 
It was an era of trying a lot of new things and failing at most of them. For instance, I have Poser 4 on here. I'm not really sure what Poser was for, no pun intended. I don't know what professional capacity this program could have had or what people did with it that was in any way productive because it seems like just a tool for making shit posts. I have a copy of it though, so I'm going to go ahead and make a video of it, even though that video will probably just look like a Monster Factory episode. Even if we have just created Bart Simpson. Don't have cow. To give you an idea of what this project of mine entails, here's something that I have that I got out of a box of floppies that I got from my parents back home. Obviously, this is some miscellaneous driver disc, but I don't recognize what this is. Quickshot made gamepads as far as I know. I don't know what a Sound Machine Pro 16 is, and this contains a shareware game on it. There's no telling what's on here. There could be some interesting audio mixer tools. There could be some sort of MIDI application that's fun to play with. There could be some sort of variant of Apogee's Word Rescue that I've never seen before. Anything could be on this disc, or it could have been overwritten with some other software, etc. Anyway you slice it, the contents of this disc are unknown, and so I'm going to put it in and figure out what's on it. So, spoiler warning, because I don't want to go through all this just to bore you, especially since this is a preview video. There was nothing really interesting on the disc. It was a bog standard copy of Word Rescue, and then some utility software that I couldn't use for a sound card I'd never heard of. With that said, that utility software turned out to be for a sound card I'd never heard of because it was some sort of strange, off-the-wall sound blaster knockoff. And, while that's not very relevant in the grand scheme of things, I don't know, I find that stuff fascinating, and if I'd made a full video out of this particular exercise, I would have gone in and shown you what I found on Google and the research that I did on it, and with any luck, somebody watching this would have been as entertained as I was by that. But part of this, part of the interest in this is the adventure, putting a disc in and finding out what is on it. Is it some fascinating relic from 1990, or is it some dead boring relic from 1990 that deserved to be forgotten? And... I find that super exciting to think about, that each one of these discs I put in could have anything on it. There's this thing here called Kid Talk. I looked this up and it seems that it's some sort of software speech synthesizer intended for edutainment purposes. I'm not sure exactly what it's like, I think I might have used it as a kid. This machine won't read it, but I'm going to replace the floppy drive and then try DD Rescue under BSD and see if I can get it recovered, and I'm really interested to see what this sounds like. Here's another piece of software I'm really interested in. This is something called Prism, and I don't think that it developed into anything later on. This is some kind of MIDI sequencer, and it looks more like a tracker, like something you'd find on the Amiga or the Atari, than like Cakewalk, for instance. You can see from the layout here, it really does resemble a tracker. I can't make heads or tails of it, so I'm interested to go and chase down a MIDI interface for this machine, which I think I have in a box somewhere hook it up, try recording into it, and see what it does. It doesn't seem to have any sort of internal synthesizer. It also seems like it was written by just one guy. I mean, look at the Nuke the Smiley's dialogue. That seems to be just entirely a test of the UI, something that made its way into production. Next up is my favorite piece of software in my collection so far, Logitech Paint Show and Paint Show. This is unsurprisingly a DOS-based drawing application, but it runs in remarkably high resolution, has a very crisp interface, it almost looks like it was lifted from the Macintosh, and maybe it was. Critically, however, primarily this software seems almost purpose-built for creating aesthetic. It has this flood fill feature that lets you flood fill with patterns, and all the default patterns are ridiculous. You can also use just a normal paintbrush to paint with these patterns, but once you've laid the patterns down, it doesn't understand that they're solid areas. So if you then try to use the paint bucket on top of existing flood-filled areas, it will paint bucket only within contiguous color spaces. In other words, it makes hash, and it makes fascinating, ridiculous hash. And you wonder to yourself, who thought this was a good idea? Who okayed this? Who was this for? Who was the target audience? Who exactly wanted this product? And that's what keeps me fascinated with vintage software and hardware. Not games nearly so much as utilities and accessories. Things people were making and buying in order to solve actual everyday problems, supposedly. The products we have nowadays for image editing, audio editing, video editing, word processing, database management, everything, they're all products of decades of abject failure. 
often single individuals who would sign the documentation of their software with their own name. Later, they'd go to court to fight and lose battles with giant corporations who stole their ideas for products that ultimately flopped and were forgotten anyway. Or if they were remembered, if they were successful, they were absorbed into the global consciousness as the way we've always done things. Because they were frontier days. It had been years since the personal computer came out. Most of the software I'll be looking at and demoing probably came out years after the Macintosh and has no real excuse to be as bad as it is, except that in the PC world, in the 80s and 90s, there was just no guidance. There were no clear indications on what you should make or how to make it. Lots of PC people had no idea what was going on over on the Mac, the Amiga, or the Atari, or they had no idea how to duplicate it on the PC. The internet wasn't really around yet, and there wasn't really any idea without spending a lot of money. There was no way to figure out what was going on over in those other worlds. So we had several generations of programmers just floundering, but it was the Wild West. So with mail order software and single floppy disks being sold at Egghead, these things made it out into the world anyway, and I want to see them. I want to see all the failures. I want to see all the forgotten gems, the things that people did right that no one remembers. We ended up getting software that became gold standards, industry practices that's actually worse than what was made back in the day that no one ever saw it because somebody didn't know how to get it into the hands of celebrities or how to get it into the hands of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So I don't know if I've made any impression on you, if you weren't already following my channel. I don't know if anything I've demoed in this video so far was interesting to you. But if it was, or if you at least see the direction that I'm going, I hope you subscribe. If you subscribe, it'll help me feel like I'm actually talking to a community of people out there and not just blasting this stuff out into the void to be ignored. And to be frank, I have motivation issues, and I have self-esteem issues, and I also have ADHD, and I'm just not entirely convinced yet that anybody cares enough for me to put this stuff up. So while I'm trying to slog through it anyway, the higher that subscriber number goes, the easier it'll be for me to believe that there are people out there who are really getting a kick out of this. I don't have much up yet, but I have a pretty substantial collection of floppies to go through already. I picked a whole bunch up at the local surplus stores and on eBay and so on. If I get some traction on this channel, I plan on continuing to buy boxes of floppies. I live in Seattle, which is a city with a long history that housed a lot of the people who independently developed software in the early days of the PC. I'm going to the local electronic surplus stores regularly looking for discs and hardware, and I'm coming home with pretty substantial hauls, honestly. I keep getting big boxes of floppies. Chances are good that if anyone shows interest in my channel, I'll be uploading these videos pretty much indefinitely, as often as I can get new stuff and find the time. And I'm not a screaming gamer, dude. I'm not interested in making wacky, like, you won't believe it videos. I'm trying to keep this low-key. I'm trying to keep this relaxing and personal because I'm not here to make money or get famous. I'm here to hang out with you and explore some neat history together. I don't want you to subscribe to make me rich. I'm hoping you will because I'm trying to connect with other people to discuss the nuances of all this ephemera. And maybe even hear from people who participated in using or creating it at the time that it was new. These are things that are forgotten in much the same way that much of the history that the Internet Archive deals with gets forgotten. The magazines, the newspapers, the software digests, the stuff that's treated as ephemera, as things that are to be looked at and then thrown away at their time. These are things that are worth looking at in the same way that old diaries and newspapers and so on are worth looking at for general human information. There is history of the human race in this, and I think that every bit of it is fascinating to look at, and it's something I can relate to because I was using software then and I'm using software now. So if any of this is in line with your interests, then I hope you'll join me here as we go through this stuff. So if you've gotten this far, thank you for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm glad you gave me the time of day, and I hope to see you again in my next much higher quality video.